Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Fluent Mosaic Meshing Technology. This is a relatively um, er late development um, where ANSYS uh, went about to create a new measure. Um, the Mosaic technology is uh, part of this new measure, and this is a freelance only um, technology. Uh, using the Mosaic meshing, you will be able to generate faster and more accurate CFD simulation, and this is what we will try to demonstrate uh, in four different points. The first one would be the introduction to the Mosaic meshing. The second, we will uh, look a little bit more into numbers, as in meshing time, scalability, accuracy, etc. Then we will look at what can be done on the server level uh, to manipulate those meshes and further uh, leverage ANSYS tools for fast and accurate CFD simulations. We will do a quick live demonstration of how to use these technologies. All right, let's get started with an introduction to the Mosaic mesh. Um, so uh, there are quite a bit of different way to mesh um, using different elements. So it can be hex core, tet, and polys. And all of those elements have different strength and uh, weaknesses. For instance, uh, typically a hex core is very good to mesh the, um, the free stream, while a poly, for instance, would be better at capturing um, gradients and curvatures, etc. Uh, that means that uh, ideally in a simulation, one would want to combine two different types of elements, uh, for instance, polys or tets, close to the geometry for their accuracy in uh, capturing uh, small features, and use hex core uh, far field. However, um, historically, this has been very difficult uh, just because linking two different cell elements are, of different topologies is, is just a difficult mathematical problem. And this is where the Mosaic uh, technology comes in. So the Mosaic technology um, can use is essentially a technology that helps uh, ANSYS mesher to connect with a polyhedral layer two different mesh types. Typically, that would be a TET prism or a poly prism and a hex core. So in this case, you have a poly prism. As you can see, the poly prism is able to capture curvature while using very little elements. You can also use TET prism, but you would need more elements for a similar capture. Then we then extrude the TET prism five times to create your five boundary layer elements. And then you have the poly layer, and then you have the hex core. Another example of this in a combustor um, simulation, uh, you can see the poly prism layer in orange. So this is a high quality, low element count uh, layer, uh, followed by in green, a polyhedral layer. Uh, that layer is used because of the malleability of the polyhedral cells. You can essentially uh, move them around uh, such that you can uh, connect conformally those, uh, the hex and the polyprism. And you can do that while conserving quality. And then you can see in blue the hex core, which of course is always perfect accuracy and very, very fast solve time. Using this technology, here is an example using uh, polytets and uh, hex core. You can, uh, you can uh, capture all the features within the Eiffel Tower using 27 million cells. Uh, so that's, that's pretty incredible. I believe if you were going to uh, poly, uh, polyprism and hex core, you may even uh, go to a lower count. Um, steel, um, steel TET prism and hex core, you can capture the cyclist. Um, if you look at the helmet, look at the details being captured by the measure. Uh, that's really doing a good job at capturing all of the details and then introducing the, the TET layer and then the hex core mesh. Other examples, this time using uh, polyprism and hex core, uh, just to show you that this technology can be leveraged in uh, aerospace industries 
for aircraft, turbine, or heat exchanger simulation, etc. There's really, uh, really no limitation on, on what can be done with a machine. All right, let's look a little bit at the machine time, scalability, and accuracy, now that we understand a little bit better what mosaic meshing means. And for that particular slide, um, this is essentially ANSYS engineers uh, modeling a boat. You can look up on the image on the left how well captured the boat is. Uh, that took them only 31 million elements, and that is, again, because we are using the polyprism, which is really good at capturing small features without uh, a large element count. And the small graph on the right uh, tells you how fast it was to mesh. So if they used only one core, they were able to mesh this boat simulation in 73 minutes. Going to four cores, they were able to do it in 25 minutes. And that's a big deal. Um, Historically, it has been proven very difficult to actually parallelize meshing when polyhedral cells are involved. So the fact that ANSYS engineers were able to gain a threefold uh, decrease in time for a fourfold increase in CPUs is actually quite an achievement. And uh, of course, the speed increase as number of CPU increases as well. Um, if you are lucky enough to be able to use 64 CPUs for a meshing, you can count on about 4.3 million elements being meshed per minute. Another example uh, relating to F1 simulation, uh, where we find a very similar trend with 220 million cells uh, were able to be generated in uh, just a little over an hour for 64 cells. or 64 CPUs, sorry. All right, now that we have an idea of how fast that measure is, and, and it is pretty fast, um, we can start looking at, okay, what does it mean in terms of simulation time and memory for the simulation? So on the left, you can see a full poly mesh, and on the right, a mesh uh, using Mosaic technology, which is, again, a poly hex core. Uh, in the center, you can see that the results between those two meshes is essentially identical. And at the bottom, you can see that using uh, the Mosaic technology, ANSYS was able to achieve 25% less memory and 55% faster simulation. Another example, this time uh, just focusing on accuracy. This is an example for hypersonic simulations. Uh, lots of physics here with uh, very, very strong shocks and expansion waves and recirculation, etc. And we can see on this slide that, um, apologies. And you can see on this slide that uh, the image captured by ANSYS engineers through the model is very similar to the image captured with uh, Schlieren photography. So this is going to conclude uh, this part of the presentation, which is that we have seen that the measure is really fast at meshing thanks to a very good parallelization algorithm. It uses less mesh count as well, which increases the speed of the meshing, but also uh, decreases uh, the time for the simulation. And in addition, we have also an increase of mesh quality, which further decreases the simulation time. If you combine all of those and use a process with the new fluent measure, uh, you can find up to 3x uh, faster simulation. All right, now that uh, we have put some numbers on meshing time, scalability, accuracy, and, and sort of quantified um, how much improvement the mosaic technology can have on your processes, uh, let's look a little bit at what can be done once um, a geometry is meshed with the solver. So one of the things you can do with a mesh, and I just want to be clear that this is not just for mosaic technology, but this can be done with a mosaic technology mesh. 
is um, the unstructured mesh adaptation. So mesh adaptation So mesh adaptation can be leveraged to split cells in a region of high gradient. Uh, the advantages are twofold. You will have better capture of the high gradient areas. And secondly, you will have a significantly lower uh, cell count for, uh, for the simulation. You can see a couple of examples on the left. It's a free surface. Uh, air water interaction on the right on the middle it's a shock wave in interacting with each other within a within a domain and on on the right it's a fluid mixture interface capture if we look at another example this time uh, that would be overset mesh overset mesh is a technique that is particularly helpful in order to uh, model moving parts. In an overset mesh, uh, there would be a background mesh, in this case a background mesh uh, linked to the center of the airfoil, and two foreground mesh, uh, one linked to the slat, one linked to the flap. And the idea is to be able to move the foreground meshes and to allow the code to interpolate between the meshes as necessary. So that makes essentially um, simulating moving parts uh, a much, much simpler process. Another, another example of, um, of overset mesh, once again, what I try to study animation, is um, a rocket uh, with two boosters that are their own meshes. So there again, uh, one background mesh linked to the central section of the rocket and uh, the two boosters would have their own foreground meshes and again the code will interpolate between all the meshes as necessary to get the solution for you and uh, another technique can be mesh mesh deformation mesh deformation is maybe a little harder to do because it's just difficult to keep the quality of the elements but that's something that can be done and can be leveraged in order to do some simulation where an object is moving. And finally, uh, uh, the iChance server for shape optimization. So you're looking at right now a pipe being optimized for uh, reduction of total pressure losses. The inlet and outlet of the pipe are fixed and the pipe is allowed to move within the bounding boxes in place. You can see that at every iteration of the code, uh, with the new shape of the pipe, uh, we have we predict lower and lower pressure drop. All right, now that we have uh, finished the theoretical part for this presentation, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a live demonstration where I will open the measure and show you around how to use it. I will also show you how to do a overset mesh and. In addition to another set mesh, I will also show you how to do mesh adaptation. All right, so for this demonstration, the geometry we have picked is a barrel with a bullet. The reason for picking this geometry is because it allows me to leverage the mosaic measure on a simulation that incorporates um, overset mesh and mesh adaptation. So I'm kind of showing three things at once. So you can here see the barrel on the, on the right, the bullet exiting the, bar the barrel on the left. And how I mesh this is with a background mesh, which is linked to the barrel, and a foreground mesh, which is linked to the bullet. So that is my background mesh right here and my foreground mesh would be right here. You can also notice that I have three more objects, which are called BOIs. So a BOI stands for body of um, influence. And essentially, it, those are volume, local volume refinements. So the BOI 1.6 will be a volume where my mesh size will be 1.6 millimeters. 
3.2 millimeters and 6.4 millimeters. So in order to mesh this, um, I'm going to use the fluent measure. So to find a fluent measure, I go in my search bar, type fluent, and this window is the window that allows you to either use the fluent measure or to directly jump to the fluent solver. So once you click on meshing, you are utilizing the fluent measure, which leverages mosaic technology. So I'm going to go and pick my mesh. So that is my bullet. And there you go. So what I am opening right now is a mesh that has already been uh, completed. We'll allow a minute or two for this to load. And there we go. So you can now see that um, this mesh was generated using a poly hex core, polyprism hex core uh, topology. And this is the kind of results that we obtained. I'm going to show you how to get there uh, in just one second. So you can see the polyprism followed by polyhedral, followed by hex core. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, start from scratch. So I'm going to remove everything that was done and just trying to use only uh, default settings, uh, try to mesh this bullet to try to show how simple that was. So the first question that the fluent measure is asking you is what is your workflow? You have watertight geometry, which is what we are going to use, a default tolerant meshing, which is for a, a dirty CAD. Um, if an engineer selects to not uh, clean up the CAD and want to use a wrapper, he can do that with a default tolerant meshing. I highly advise, when possible, to clean up the CAD and use watertight geometry. So the first question will be uh, to import your geometry. So we're going to do just that. So the software is now importing the bullet geometry. The next question would be, do you want to have local sizing? So let me go ahead and look at what can be done. So you can refine by size, by face size. So those are local refinement on the face. You can do body size. Those are essentially um, what size of a body you would like to have. You have Body of influence, this is a sub-volume uh, that we uh, saw uh, just earlier, so that you would put that body of influence inside a body of influence refinement and say how much how many millimeters square uh, cubes you want the mesh size to be in there. Face of influence, curvature, and proximity. So you would find all your typical local refinement in here. Uh, for the sake of showing you that uh, the default settings are really good, I'm going to say no. I'm also going to use the default settings for the surface mesh, where the code auto-detected uh, the minimum size, the maximum size, the curvature, etc. And I would just want to show you that, again, the default settings will be uh, pretty good, actually. So in order to display the surface mesh just created, I have to go right here on that icon. I click on it, and now you can see the surface mesh with all the curvature captured pretty well. Uh, next, uh, describe geometry. On this one, I use always, always the same setup, which is this one. Then he asked me for boundaries. So we have this boundary right here, uh, which I have labeled as interface. So this is going to be a internal boundary. Um, the code found the two regions, one associated with the bullet, one associated for all the volume around the bullet. So I'm going to say that the bullet is a dead region. The code is asking me if I want to add boundary layers. By default, uh, it will put three boundary layers on every wall. 
for the sake of this demo, I'm going to go ahead and put six. And finally, last question, the code is asking me what mesh elements I want to use. So I have a choice between polyhedra, tetrahedra, hex core, and polyhex core. And the polyhex core typically will be the mesh leveraging the mosaic technology. The hex core uh, leverage also the mosaic technology just with a, uh, a tet prism layer. So polyhex core will be your poly prism and hex core. And we'll give just a minute for this to mesh. All right, so this actually mesh in um, about uh, 0.12 minutes. So that was blistering fast. And here is uh, the results from this. So when I slice this by Z location, I can uh, move the cursor uh, left and right. Um, and I can also remove the cell layer so that we can just look at the surface mesh. So you can see the, poly, the polygonal surface mesh. And then the cell layer, uh, then you can see here the prism layer, polyprisms, then polyhedral, then hex. So I think I have demonstrated that essentially using almost only default settings, you can achieve uh, high quality meshes. All right, let me do another example, but this time with something that's a little bit more involved, which is the mesh of the barrel. All right, so let's allow a minute for this mesh to load. The difference with the mesh with the barrel is that you have to have refinements uh, on the barrel itself. You have to have body of influences as well if you want to control uh, the mesh. So you can see here you have one body of influence that was created that is linked to actually um, the body of influence one. Um, you have a face size that is linked to the inlet surface of the barrel, a face size that is linked to the inside of the barrel, and you have the body of influence two and the body of influence three uh, right here. They don't show up here, but they are linked to the surface called uh, body of influence uh, 6.4 millimeters. Then we meshed using these parameters, and we went through uh, the rest of the tree, uh, very similarly to previous example. And here is the result of uh, this meshing. So you can see here uh, quite clearly actually where I had my body of influence for local volume refinements. So this here center circle would be 1.6, this would be 3.2 and this would be 6.4. We can also move this slider to try to see um, the inside of the barrel a little bit more. Right, no barrel here, there we go. I zoomed in too far. So you can click on this um, magnifying glass if you need to uh, zoom out or zoom in. All right, and so I am moving in until I see, there we go, until I see the mesh inside the barrel. All right, so now that I have two meshes, what am I going to do with those? So in order to, in order for, for us to simulate this barrel and bullet simulation, you have to have two meshes. So the very first thing you will want to do is, well, import the first mesh. That's pretty typical. And you can set it up uh, as usual with a boundary condition inlet here, maybe another inlet here, maybe a pressure outlet here. That's typical uh, a boundary condition setup, typical simulation setup. The second thing you will want to do, which is not typical, is you will want to use the append function to bring the foreground mesh. So this is a little, a little, a little um, misleading. They call it case, but it's actually a mesh that you're going to load in this particular case. So you would come and grab your bullet mesh and bring it in. 
what that would do is it would create the second uh, mesh right here. So you would have the what is called fluid right now, which is actually my background mesh, and what is called solid, which is actually my foreground mesh. Um, once you have those two meshes, you will want to go ahead and start doing uh, mesh motions, where you can essentially say that the bullet is uh, moving forward at V in, which is 600 meter per second in this case. Uh, then you would want to go inside the binary condition and um, select the outer face of the foreground mesh and put it as an overset mesh. So how you would do that is essentially you can right click on binary conditions. This would be an internal and go in here until you find uh, overset. So once you have this overset binary condition, you go into interfaces overset right here. And that's an easy task. You press buff, the background, then the foreground, and just click on create. And that will make sure that the code understands that you're doing overset meshing. Please note that uh, you don't have to have mesh motion to do overset meshing, but typically you would have mesh motion. Um, the next step is how do you do uh, mesh adaptation? So in order to do mesh adaptation, uh, you have a couple of steps. The first step is you have to define cell registers. Those are invalid because I don't have a solution right now, but as soon as I have a solution, they will become valid. So a cell register, you would do right click, new, and field variable register. And so right now, I am essentially derefining uh, creating a, a register which just uh, captures cells which are below 200 of pressure gradient. Similarly, I have a cell register which is a uh, pressure gradient above 1000 for the refinement criteria. Once you have your two cell registers, uh, you can go into the adapt right here, click on it, and that's when you would assign those refine and derefinement uh registers for your mesh adaptation all right once everything is set up uh it's time for initialization and run all right so we are currently running the simulation and you can see right here the overset meshes so uh, you can see the two meshes uh, right here interpenetrating each other and that's okay that's exactly what uh uh, the mesh overset is for, and the code will uh, interpolate between those two meshes uh, to find the solution. Now we just arrive at the next time step with our first uh, mesh adaptation refinement, and you could see all of those cells uh, becoming uh, more refined. And the reason why they are becoming more refined, uh, I am showing you right now the pressure around the bullet. And you can see that we have actually the shock waves that are starting to appear and strong expression waves as well. So the, um, the criterion I created based on gradients were able to capture that and say, hey, uh, I am above 1000 uh, gradient of pressure, so I should probably refine those cells. We're gonna let it go to the next level. And essentially what happens is that at every single uh, uh, time steps, the bullet move one notch, the adaptation uh, readapt the mesh, and ongoing until the simulation is done. So we are at the end of this uh, time step. So there we go. We saw the bullet move forward a little bit, the mesh adapting, and of course uh, the pressure, the shock waves uh, being formed, uh, becoming stronger and stronger until they are. Uh, completely established. This concludes my presentation on uh, the Mosaic technology and um, the server technology that can be done uh, to leverage the Mosaic meshes and create a more accurate and faster simulations. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, feel free to reach me if you have any questions.